Nuclear Hot Seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear Hot Seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear Hot Seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear Hot Seat, it's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what happens when the so-called nuclear experts get it wrong. This week, we got a surprise because we called an activist in Texas for a comment on one story and learned about an entirely new breaking story on nukes in that state. Karen Haddon, executive director of the SEED Coalition, brings us up to the minute on the NRC's approval of foreign entity Toshiba's ownership and probable control of two proposed nuclear reactors in Texas. A reminder of how international our movement is comes in an interview with Massimo Greco, an Italian anti-nuclear activist facing charges because of his support of a Sardinian anti-nuclear protest. And Beverly Findlay Caneco tells us about a different approach to informing people about the problems with nukes and Fukushima without scaring them away. And a final thought on the passing of Michael Rupert not specifically an anti-nuclear activist, but an anti-insanity activist and a friend to us all. Those interviews and features, plus numbnuts of the week, all will be coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, April 15, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. This is our breaking story today. There have been no dramatic changes at the Waste Isolation Project plant in the WIP site in Carlsbad, New Mexico this week, but we did contact Karen Hayden, Executive Director of Sustainable Energy and Economic Development Coalition, or SEED Coalition, looking for information on the WCS site in Andrews, Texas, where the WIP waste is now being shipped. But instead... We got this breaking news out of Texas and caught her mere moments after the NRC's Atomic Safety and Licensing Board ruled that even though Japanese-owned Toshiba is funding 100% of pre-license activities for two proposed South Texas project reactors, the license applicant is not subject to foreign control or domination prohibitions of the Atomic Energy Act. Here's what Karen Haddon had to say shortly after she learned the news. Karen, you're with the SEED Coalition, which is a watchdog group in Texas dealing with nuclear and other environmental issues. Can you tell us what just took place in Texas today that is such a setback for anti-nuclear interests? We've had a great fight here, a very successful one, against the South Texas Nuclear Project proposed nuclear reactors, Units 3 and 4. Two are in existence, but two more have been proposed. And we've held them off and we've fought them, and they were the first in the nation to come forward in this recent so-called nuclear renaissance. Now we've held off through citizen action for years and through legal action and expected to win our recent battle at the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board. However, just today we got a very bad decision that involves the contention. It was uh, about foreign ownership control and domination, and clearly Toshiba owns and will control almost all of the nuclear reactors that are proposed. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission staff was actually on our side for the first and only time through an extended legal battle on many issues. They were 100% on our side that these plants would violate existing policy for our nuclear reactors not being foreign-owned. Yet the judge has ruled in favor of the applicant that wants to build new reactors. We're very, very concerned about this precedent, and very little information was given by the judge 
You said that much of the information was sealed and kept secret? Yes, a lot of this particular case was held behind closed doors and, and you had to get a confidentiality waiver to be part of it. We chose not to because we didn't want to have to hedge our words when we were talking to the media. Basically, it was largely about the amount of money Toshiba has spent is why they went behind closed doors, which I think is extensive. However, the law is the law, and the judge has ruled in favor of developing these reactors despite the fact that they totally violate the NRC's own policies. So we don't know yet what legal recourse we'll take at this moment. It's been a long and expensive fight, and it's really all about business interests being protected and the public's interests not being protected. A lot of the decision will be redacted as well. And so far, we've only heard that the judge has ruled in favor of the applicant, and yet almost no information is out there until they decide what they have to redact and keep out of the public eye. When do you expect that information, limited as it is, will be made available? Maybe as much as a month before they give anything involving their reasoning. Basically, the judge seems to feel that if you sink a certain amount of money, you're somehow entitled to approval and ultimately a license. And this is what the message is to us. It's very disheartening. The utilities that have been partners in this project have not fared well, and this has been a project that has been dragged out and fought for several years now. In San Antonio, CPS Energy spent $400 million before they pulled back to a 7% ownership share. They had been a 50% partner before that. Then NRG in Houston pulled back after spending about $400 million. So the losses for the utilities have been piling up. They've no longer been investing any money. However, if a license does get issued, I think we're going to see this same battle all over again, waged full-fledged once again, despite the fact that we thought this nuke was just about pretty much dead. Karen, we will definitely stay in touch with you and schedule a much longer interview on nuclear hot seat in a very few weeks. Thanks. I really look forward to it. We're really the hot seat of a lot of radioactive issues right now, especially the radioactive dumping um, as there are attempts to bring transuranic and high-level waste to Texas at this time. Karen Haddon of the SEED Coalition in Texas. We're working on a nuclear hot seat special for two weeks from now. It will be an update on all of what's happening in the Southwest Featuring Don Hancock on the WIP site, Karen Haddon on the Waste Control Specialist site in Andrews, Texas, where the WIP waste is being sent, and possibly a national anti-nuclear leader familiar with the macro issues involved in these problems. That will be a Southwest U.S. special on April 29th on Nuclear Hot Seat. Continuing with this week's news, bad news continues from the Hanford site in Washington State. An unprecedented string of unknown chemical vapor exposures, at least that's what they're calling them now, has sent more than two dozen workers at the Hanford site to the hospital or doctor since mid-March. According to a report by King 5 Seattle's ACE investigative reporter Susanna Frame, who interviewed the workers, the situation is far more serious than the feds and the contractors are letting on. All of the employees were not and still are not back to work, and many have symptoms far worse than irritation. Right before coming to the interview, a doctor cauterized one of her interviewees, Becky Holland's nose, to stop a week's worth of nosebleeds. Another interviewee, Steve Ellingson, spent all the day before throwing up. Symptoms of the workers include nosebleeds, intense headaches, sweats and shaking, burning lungs, and the need for nonstop narcotics to cope. Employees also report that they forget a lot of things to the point where it is very frightening to them. Note that all of these symptoms, while being attributed to a chemical vapor exposure, could also be consistent with exposure to nuclear radiation. As regards exposure to radiation, 
more news from additional sailors who were exposed to radiation from Fukushima by being on an humanitarian aid mission to Fukushima immediately immediately after the earthquake and tsunami and during the worst of the radioactive plume coming out of that site. One sailor had been told to go up to the top of the ship and take down the American flag. He took the flag down and folded it up in the triangle way that they usually do and put it under his arm. This according to attorney Charles Bonner, one of the attorneys representing the USS Reagan sailors in a lawsuit against Tokyo Electric Power Company. Bonner continued, He folded the flag, put it under his arm, and went all the way down to the bottom of the ship to store it. By the time he reached the bottom of the ship, his whole left side, where the flag was, had become inflamed. They immediately stripped his clothes off, hosed him down, washed him down with soap. He is naked there in front of all the sailors, men and women, because it became an extreme emergency. Then 17 other sailors were immediately scrubbed down. This sailor had to be discharged. He and his wife, he ended up marrying a young lady on ship. They both had to be discharged for medical reasons. She developed leukemia, uterine cancer, uncontrolled uterine bleeding. As regards legal actions in this lawsuit against TEPCO, according to Paul Garner, the lead attorney in the case, TEPCO is filing a motion to dismiss on May 5th. Their motion is scheduled for oral argument in San Diego on July 8th at 10 a.m. It is expected that many of the sailor victims will be present at that time to demonstrate to Judge San Martino an insight into the harm caused by TEPCO's withholding information about the meltdown that had already occurred on March 11 when the sailors sailed into the deadly seas. In addition to the ASLB's ruling in Texas today, two more thumbs down for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Owners of at least two dozen nuclear reactors across the United States, including the operator of Indium Point 2 in Buchanan, New York, just butt up against New York City, have told the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that they cannot show that their reactors would withstand the most severe earthquake that revised estimates say they might face. This according to industry experts. As a result, the reactor's owners will be required to undertake extensive analyses of their structures and components. Those are generally stronger standards than assumed in licensing documents. But owners of some plants may be forced to make physical changes and are likely to spend about $5 million each just for the analysis. Hmm. Nuclear reactors make a profit of approximately $1 million a day. So what we're talking about is five days of profits. I guess this would cut into their petty cash or their lunch money. Mm -mm -mm. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is always ready to cover the industry's tochus, is presuming for the time being at least that plants built to the old standard do not present any immediate risk. Of course, they don't define where immediate ends and, gee, we're in trouble, begins. But critics say that that concept by the NRC contradicts one of the recommendations made by a task force of commissioned senior staff members after the earthquake and tsunami in Japan three years ago, which caused three, count them, three reactors to melt down at Fukushima, and we haven't found the corium yet. One recommendation was that the commission reevaluate and upgrade the original design requirements. Yeah, think. Now, Senator Edward Markey, a Democrat of Massachusetts and a longtime critic of the commission, said in a statement, the NRC should be demanding implementation of seismic safety upgrades it called for following the Fukushima meltdowns, not merely more study of nuclear reactors that it knows are clearly at higher risk than was previously believed. What is needed is action to secure at-risk nuclear reactors, not merely more reports. Don't hold your breath, Ed. They won't do it on their own dime. You're a U.S. senator. Make them comply. Come on. Cojones, please. And on Wednesday, April 9, the NRC announced that it had denied a post-Fukushima petition to expand the emergency planning zones around the country's nuclear power plants, saying the current zones are sufficient. Sufficient for whom? NRC commissioners who don't live anywhere near one? 
The petition was filed in February 2012, 11 months after the Fukushima Daiichi disaster in Japan, by the international nonprofit Nuclear Information Resource Service, or NIRS. It was supported by 37 environmental organizations across the country. More than 3,000 people asked the NRC to consider them co-petitioners, and nearly 6,000 comments of support were submitted, this according to the NIRS blog. The NRC has failed the American people, said Michael Marriott, former president of NIRS, in a written statement. Rather than learn from Fukushima and act appropriately to protect the public, the agency has chosen to protect the nuclear power industry yet again. Diane Turco, founder of the Cape Downwinders, an activist group on Cape Cod, expressed disappointment but not surprise. She said, once again, the NRC will not uphold its mandate and should be investigated by Congress. Excuse me, Senator Markey, are you listening to this? Turco went on to say, the NRC will defend the nuclear industry's right to do business over our right of safety. In an email, NRC spokesmodel Neil Sheehan said his agency denied the petition because it concluded the current size of the emergency planning zones is appropriate for existing reactors and because emergency plans will provide an adequate level of protection of the public health and safety in the event of an accident at a nuclear power plant. Tell that to the people on Cape Cod who can't even get out of their driveways on a weekend because traffic is so hard. What would happen if Pilgrim Power Plant blew? The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, protecting people and the environment. Not. Meanwhile, what would it take to stage a nuke out to enlist people to pick a day and take to the roads at a particular time as if there actually were a nuclear accident and radiation release at Pilgrim Power Plant. I bet it would at least make headlines and bring the issue to more people's attention. Just a thought. A ray of hope for us in energy news came from Goldman Sachs and was based on the one thing the nuclear industry respects. Money. Goldman Sachs says declining prices of solar plus battery storage means that by 2033, homeowners will no longer need to be on the grid in the U.S. Oh, come on, guys, we can do it faster than that. But Goldman Sachs goes on to say that it will happen sooner in expensive electricity states like New York and California. Japan's radiation information, of course, continues to be no bueno. On Tuesday, April 8th, the IAEA itself reported a radioactive spike in the ocean off Fukushima. It's the highest level of cesium-137 at that location since 2011. 22,000 becquerels per cubic meter of water in the Pacific outside the port. Japan notified the IAEA of elevated readings, and this is according to TEPCO's own readings. A new radioactive leak was reported at Fukushima on Sunday, April 13. Up to one ton of radioactive water leaked out of a plastic storage tank at Fukushima number 1 nuclear plant. That's what TEPCO calls it, and they were the ones who reported this information. In addition, TEPCO fessed up to the fact that a water leak back in August at the same location was far more toxic than announced. Seven months later, they're telling us this. TEPCO said the water contained 280 million becquerels per liter of beta-ray-emitting radioactive materials, such as strontium-90. What they'd said back then was that it was 80 million becquerels. Ah! It's only one number. It's a small number. It's a two. What's the big deal, dude? 200 million becquerels off they were in their reporting. A total of 300 tons of toxic water was found to have leaked at that time, part of which is believed to have flowed into the adjacent Pacific Ocean. Yeah, think? The Nuclear Regulatory Authority in Japan assessed the severity of the accident to be level three on an eight-point international scale. In order to get to a level eight in Japan, it would have to take place in the Soviet Union. Soviet's bad. Japan, which has nice electronics, U.S. trade partner, the greatest little cars, and sushi. Japan is good, so Japan only gets a three. 
just so you understand, this calculation, according to our good friends at enenews.com, 300 tons of radioactive water that contains 280 million becquerels per liter adds up to 84 trillion becquerels of beta ray emitting radioactive materials such as strontium-90 released into our good old Pacific Ocean. Sushi, anyone? Not. Experts are saying that the nuclear chain reactions at Fukushima may have lasted for more than seven months and that there was neutron leakage from active molten fuel. This according to one of two really important Fairwinds videos from 2011 that are about periodic nuclear chain reactions. You can catch them on their site, fairwinds.org. It's also fairwinds.com. Just put an E at the end of fair and you'll find them. And a current Fairwinds video has some really upsetting news in it. It is a report from Chiho Kaneko, member of the board of directors of Fairwinds Energy Education, who is originally from Iwate, Japan. She said, I have heard many Fukushima people's personal accounts of their family members or friends dying suddenly. In one case, a baby suddenly died. And these illnesses and sudden deaths are not happening only in Fukushima Prefecture. People are sicker in Tokyo. During my month-long stay in Japan in December and January, I, too, experienced unusual symptoms. I developed a skin rash that doesn't heal. When I was in Fukushima, I developed a scratchy throat and pain in my eyes. Something is happening, and yet we cannot prove anything. The IAEA and Fukushima Medical University are working together to collect and collate the health data of Fukushima residents. Many residents fear that this effort is just a show, or worse yet, just for the sake of collecting secret data. Many people fear that the experts already have a foregone conclusion, the conclusion that if people get ill, it is not because of the Fukushima Daiichi disaster. There is more information from Chiho Kaneko. Her report is quite powerful and quite moving. And we urge you to go to the website fairwinds, F-A-I-R-E-W-I-N-D-S dot org or dot com and check it out for yourselves. Which leads us to Nuclear Hot Seed, Nuclear Hot Seed, Nuclear Hot Seed, none that sound a week. Listen up class because there will be a quiz. Did you know that in Japan... The topic of nuclear radiation and atomic particles are not part of the elementary students' science curriculum? That's right. And why did they skip over including the accident in their textbooks? Well, because it's not sensitive to mention something like this. According to one editor, we could not deal with the issue negatively when our textbook is used in some municipalities hosting a nuclear plant. On the other side, the lone textbook from Dianopo Toshu Publishing Company, which mentioned the accident, only wrote, The earthquake off the Pacific coast of the Tohoku region triggered an accident at a nuclear power plant and adds effective use of resources as a lesson from it. Editor-in-Chief Takahiro Yano of Gako Toshu Company, one of the six textbook publishers, tried to include the topic of radiation as background for the Fukushima accident. We thought that if it is a science textbook, he said, the issue should be included, and tried a simple explanation of the works of Madame Curie, the Polish scientist who is recognized for some of the first research into radiation. The ministry would not even include this minor a mention, saying, there is no appropriate relation with the curriculum's guidelines. So the publisher scrapped it all together. We are watching the powers that be manufacture history right before our very eyes and right under our noses and any other analogy that involves a portion of the body. And that's why the 
textbook publishers in Japan are recognized as this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. A quick tour of international news. In France, Prime Minister Manuel Valls, the new Prime Minister, vowed to pursue plans to curb the nation's reliance on nuclear power with an energy law to be unveiled by the end of June. He said, the law that will be discussed in depth by Parliament will be the text for our new energy policy for France for the future. In a truly numbnuts move, a new law approved by the German cabinet aims to keep down the costs and slow down the rate of growth of renewable energy. This as the country continues with its energy transition away from nuclear. The Energiewenden policy adopted by Germany in 2011 in reaction to the Fukushima nuclear disaster in Japan calls for the closure of all the country's nuclear power plants by 2022, pushing to replace the lost capacity with an increase in renewables. But legal challenges by the operators of Germany's remaining nuclear power plants and those already forced to close down continue at both national and European levels, with utilities pressing claims for compensation and particularly suing the government over an ongoing nuclear tax introduced in November of 2010. And manufacturers of nuclear fuel within the European Union will be eligible for national subsidies to cope with the additional costs of using electricity generated by renewable sources in operations. This according to new rules announced by Brussels. This ties my brain in a knot. The European Commission said last week that it would approve support offered by EU governments to energy-intensive industries as a response to the burden imposed by high electricity prices coming from taxes and levies intended to finance renewable energy. These new rules apply retroactively from July 1st of 2011. Look, don't subsidize the industries. Subsidize alternatives so that the price is kept down. That would make sense, don't you think? In Czechoslovakia, the Czech energy giant CEZ announced last Thursday that it was canceling plans to build two new nuclear reactors in the Temelin nuclear power plant. The deal, which was estimated to be worth hundreds of billions of crowns, meaning over five billion U.S. dollars, was shelled a day after the government stated it would not offer any state guarantees in the project. The two remaining bidders in the deal, U.S.-based Westinghouse and Russian-led consortium MIR-1200, have been left empty-handed, and so they backed out. Good going, Czechoslovakia. And here's the latest fashion statement from Israel. An Israeli company called Stemrad has developed a body belt to purportedly protect people from the worst effects of gamma radiation. Oren Milstein, co-founder of Stemrad, says it's partially made out of lead and is designed to first and foremost protect the pelvic area, where most of the body's renewable bone marrow is made, according to a Reuters report. More than just bone marrow, guys. Think reproduction. At just over 5 kilos, meaning 33 pounds, the belt would be wearable for most people. Just what I wanted to have strapped around my hips? A three-year-old. A full body suit to protect all the body's vital organs, such as the liver and thyroid, would weigh about 200 kilos, or 440 pounds. So it's not going to work for anyone who isn't a sumo wrestler. But the manufacturers claim the belt can protect the wearer for doses up to 1,000 rads, or 1 million millirems, or 10 sieverts, or an uncountable number of becquerels. I couldn't get the conversion right. As for me, I'm holding out for the ultimate outfit, a lead-lined burqa and a gas mask. Just so you know, I'm working with a team of helpers to get Nuclear Hot Seat website fixed after its hack attack. We have a temporary redirect page up at the regular address, if you haven't found it already. NuclearHotSeat.com is there, at least for a single page, and we will be posting our episode links there for a time being. I'll also be posting a direct link on Tuesday nights on the Facebook Nuclear Hot Seat pages. It won't be pretty, but you will get an audio. You can also access the entire archive through iTunes, and we will soon be back with the latest audios on YouTube as well. I want to thank everyone who has been so supportive of me and this show with your comments, 
suggestions, and yes, thank you very much, your donations. We now have a secure donate button up on the temporary page, so if you can, please donate to help us get past this glitch and reload the site in a much more secure manner. Volunteers are helping as best they can, but this is going to take some paid help as well. So whatever you can do, boy, is it ever appreciated. Now on to our feature interview. Massimo Greco has been an anti-nuclear activist in Italy since 1982. A video maker and founder of RNA.org, an anti-nuclear and no-oil organization, he maintains the site nonukes.it and nonukes.eu. He joined us via Skype from Italy. Listen closely, as he has a lovely Italian accent, and let's face it, his English is better than my Italian. Massimo Greco, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Welcome to you too, and How greetings from Italy. How long have you been involved with the anti-nuclear movement in Italy, and what has been the nature of some of the work you've done? There are many different steps. I started in 1983 and following all the battles for the first referendum that we had in Italy in 1987. Explain to the listeners what that referendum was about. We have this option recognized from our constitution is a very important instrument to change law. In Italy, the referendum is only abrogative to delete a law, not in other way, not like Switzerland, for example, but it's very important. And people that want to promote a referendum need to collect legally almost half million of signing. So it needs a half million signatures before it can move forward. With a hard procedure, because they need to be legal signed, not like a petition, just to, <laughs> to explain better. What was this referendum about? That age was starting a new nuclear program from the government of the time with many projects of new power station and at the time there was a large movement of protest against this project. Many, many, many organizations and also with the parliamentary representatives were involved to promote the referendum. There were many referendums. Three questions was to stop the nuclear program of the government. And another important point of this referendum was to make forbidden for Italian companies to make business in nuclear meaning outside from Italy and especially uh, statal companies, because we have in Italy many, many companies owned by the state. So we stopped the nuclear program for more than 25 years. was just one year after Chernobyl. So for people, there was more information to understand why was important this battle. Year by year, many companies started to make business in nuclear program outside from Italy. And it was not possible to stop this business. That's about the first story of the referendum here. So the referendum was used to stop the nuclear industry from growing within Italy? Yes were stopped for nuclear plants. So four nu nuclear reactors were taken down because of this. They were yeah. stopped. Had they been built yet, or were they just in the planning stages? No, no, no. They are um, under this mission with all the problems of the, this mission, uh, problems about waste, decontamination of the area, etc. 
So with the nuclear reactors having been taken down by referendum, what has Italy been doing in the decommissioning process, and what have they been doing with the waste? We have still the problem of the waste, and many problems are because secret. Because some year ago, government put the secret of state about traffic and nuclear transportation. I know that we know for the Chronicles that there are trash sent via railway to the northern of France or in England. And we saw a few weeks ago to Canada through United States. So, in other words, Italy is just shipping the waste to other countries, including in North America, the U.S. and Canada? Uh, last year, new is about that. I just was reading an article of uh, Ottawa Citizen. is a newspaper, a Canadian newspaper, I think, that confirmed this traffic and confirmed also the cover-up of this traffic. This traffic was through cargo, a cargo called Pacific Igret. So Italy has been shipping its nuclear waste to other countries, to France, England, Canada, and the United States? Yes, in the direction of France for sure, and for England for sure. And, and for United States, for sure. Via railway, there were many demonstrations, anti-nuclear demonstrations on the border between Italy and France, for example. I followed one in 2011 with thousands of policemen <laughs> to protect this kind of transportation. What is the current state of the anti-nuclear movement in Italy now? Do you still find yourselves active? And if so, what's the focus of the activism? After the last referendum, I think that the activists disappeared. After the last winning, maybe we forgot that this time, I don't think that the state and the companies will wait other 25 years because to push again for nuclear program. So there is no nuclear program right now in Italy, is that correct? Yes, at the moment, not. The only problem is about waste. Talk to us about what happened with you with the event at the university that has set you up for a difficult situation. Almost three years ago, we organized many actions in Sardinia where there are different problems and there was a governor that was pushing for nuclear programs. All this happened just a few weeks before the referendum. And we organized different actions uh, inside the military polygons to inform in the university. And they denied the space for us for a congress. And this entity is controlled for the state, but is controlled by politics. So at few weeks from the referendum, they saw our project like a political project. This was the excuse to deny the space for us. And we had in few days to organize different space, paying, uh, etc. So many people protested very hard and I gave them space on the website of the RNA. From then, I am under accusement about what was written against this entity of the state. And when you say under accusement, the officials took what the other people were posting that you hadn't written but was posted on your site, and they were accusing you of, of what? 
in Italy there are many strange laws and they are preparing order <laughs> to stop blogs and cetera and we have also law of 60 years ago created under the fascism all laws about opinion so it's possible that if you are fighting with someone not on the chat not on facebook but on some website you risk always to have accusement for many reasons the sense of accusement i think is typical but was that uh, i offended the owner of director of this entity <laughs> And what has happened as a result of this accusement? If I go to see the law, how is the situation? I can risk from three or six months until three years of prison. To make an example, is an example, no? Accuse, for example, a big company that produces energy from coal. If the news that I create is going to circulate very much, they can stop me with same accusement, asking me damages. Because a big company has a lot of money if their business is to be stopped from the magistracy, no? And they have, of course, a lot of lawyers normal people can't have. So in other words, it's like being sued in the United States. You say something, somebody doesn't like it, they hit you with a lawsuit to try and collect damages. In Italy, with the accusement that you are under, what is going to happen to you? What do you have to go through and what might the consequences be in your life? to spend a lot of money because here in justice a story like that can start for example in May and finish inside two years. That would be a trial that could last up to two years? Yeah, because here is so you can wait years and years before to know the result of a permanent condemn or waiting all the steps of the justice we have three three level of justice if they condemn me now i can make opposition to appeal another level consider another couple of years if i want they can make opposition too <laughs> to re rewrite the process. Until the high court, it can be necessary, in many cases, also 10 years. In the way, you spend a lot of money for advocate and other bureaucratic things. Uh, of course, I am not a businessman. <laughs> I have not hundreds of advocates and, and for normal people uh, is very dangerous. There are a lot of risks eh, to have fighting with some kind of people or politics or businessmen. And is it possible that you may end up having to do prison time? I have no idea at this moment. I'm waiting the start of this process, the start of the court, and I will see and wait. <laughs> what, if anything, could listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat do to support you as you are going into this lawsuit? Is there a way we could make noise or have an online petition? Or is there anything we could do that would be helpful to you? I was thinking to another experience that was in France a few months ago during a demonstration against nuclear transportation uh, there was accusement in confront of one only activist but there was a nice experience of solidarity where more than 30 people French people 
made uh, auto self accusement other mm, demonstrators did this civil action i am guilty too i did the same and the tribunal the court refused that but condemned the, the activist only for a penalty about town traffic and they blocked the road to stop nuclear transportation and that can be very hard if you are condemned because they can charge accusement for terrorism too in that situation the solidarity of the movement changed the opinion of the court and the activist was condemned only to a little penalty like a driver a fine or a ticket as opposed to having to do time in prison yes that was the nice experience of solidarity i didn't imagine that in italy because really after the referendum people forgot everything maybe because the winning there is not concentration now about was problem about nuclear problem people forgot everything for this i think but many people think the same that this time government politics and companies will not wait other 20 years after a referendum do you see yourself continuing to take actions on behalf of the anti-nuclear movement in italy even while you are under this accusement are you allowed to do so i never stop that was massimo greco founder of rna.org and a longtime italian anti-nuclear activist who we hope will be staying out of prison We'll keep you posted as to what is happening in his case. A reminder that my ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond, if you go to the book's site on Amazon, you can read an excerpt from the beginning for free, free, free. Then buy a copy and download the free Kindle software for reading an ebook on any digital device. It will cost you less than a cup of Starbucks here in the United States. And if you like Nuclear Hot Seat, you're gonna love this book. For our activist shout out this week, we talked with Beverly Finlay Kaneko, no stranger to listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat, this time about an event she's producing on April 27th. Beverly, your group, Families for Safe Energy, is producing a rather important event at least in my eyes it's happening on Sunday April 27 in Gardena California would you tell us what childhood in Fukushima is going to be about we have invited a former elementary school principal from Fukushima his name is Sensuke Shishido and he actually is a really popular speaker throughout Japan uh among educators and also just the general public talking about children in Fukushima and his uh, thrust is a little bit different he's not really an anti-nuclear speaker per se he's more talking about the well-being of the children in the wake of the triple disaster and he brings up some points that we often don't think about What is going to be the nature of this event which is subtitled Finding Hope in Adversity? He talks about his own personal experience overseeing a, an elementary school right after the disaster and seeing the children having to adapt to this whole new environment of wearing the glass badge radiation monitors of not being outside to play and uh, another thing that he has done in addition to speaking all around the country and and working with children is try to advocate for what we call traveling classrooms and this would be sort of like an outdoor school for Fukushima children to with official government funding to be able to leave the prefecture for short trips so that they have outdoor experiences 
as part of their education. What other speaking engagements is Sensuke Kishido going to be taking part in while he is in the United States? The major part of the tour that we've set up for him is going to educational institutions. So he is going to be visiting elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, and universities because Families for Safe Energy, our real goal is to be able to support communities and schools in learning about safe energy choices. It just so happens that, you know, because our background is Japan, that our main thing that we've been doing is raising awareness about Fukushima. But we really like to focus on not preaching to the choir. We like to bring the message to the greater community at large, and we like to have people like Mr. Shishido who are approachable, that can kind of open people's eyes without bludgeoning them with really heavy-duty anti-nuclear message. All of us in our hearts are anti-nuclear, but if we're going to reach the greater community, I think we need to change the messaging. So this is one of the things a speaker like him is able to do, is to go into the schools, because he's he's not coming in with a real heavy-duty political message. It's more a humanitarian message. It's more talking about the children. This strikes me as a perfect way to get the message about safe energy to those who are going to be part of the next generation and generation that are going to have to be dealing with the aftermath of nuclear and coming up with the policy and the implementation of policy to create a safe energy future. Exactly. It also, I think, helps develop compassion among children and young people here when they're able to see what's going on in other places, what's happening because of the lifestyles that we live and all of the things that we take for granted. When they see this happening, it makes a little light bulb go off in their head. I think that that's really important is developing that compassion for other human beings and starting to gain a small awareness of the issue of human rights. If activists or others in the greater community who are listening to Nuclear Hot Seat would like to be in contact with Mr. Shishido and possibly book him as a speaker, perhaps arrange his next trip to the United States, what would be the best way of following up and getting in touch? The best way is to go through us with Families for Safe Energy, and you can always go to our Facebook page, which is Families for Safe Energy, and we also have an email address listed on that page, and you could even link it there on Nuclear Hot Seat. Well, not until we have our website back together. Thank you. (laughs) We're working on it. It's a minor obstacle. It's not going to stop us. How long is Mr. Shishido going to remain in the United States on this speaking tour? He'll be here from April 25th, and he leaves on May 3rd. So it's a short trip. And in that trip, we're going to be in Southern California, and we're also heading to the Grand Canyon We're uh, doing a school visit there, and we're also meeting up with the Sierra Club and the Grand Canyon Trust and doing a little bit of educating ourselves about the issues with the abandoned uranium mines and the uh, human rights issues going on there in Arizona. It sounds like a great trip, a great exchange of information is going to take place. And hopefully there will be other opportunities to bring Mr. Shishido over here and carry his message to those who perhaps would be resistant to a more activist and political message but want to hear about the children. Yes, absolutely. Beverly Finlay Kaneko of Families for Safe Energy. John Stewart, you got to cover nuclear, John. I can help. Call me. And... Happy Pesach.
Here's today's final thought, and it's a serious one. Michael Rupert was a fine broadcaster, researcher, interviewer, buster of myths. He took on big stories, big people, and regularly nailed them. Michael went further into conspiracy theory than I do, and I could not follow him there, but we found plenty to agree upon when it came to the nuclear issue. He produced and hosted the Lifeboat Hour on PRN, and I was honored to be his guest on the show on March 16, only four weeks ago. Last Sunday, April 13, after he finished his broadcast, he went home and shot himself to death. Apparently, it was a planned event to end his life, the culmination of the weight of what he knew, what he shared, and the darkness that came over him never left. He posted his farewell on Facebook, which I now read. He said, I pray to all things seen and unseen, known and unknown, for we are all one. The prophecies are being fulfilled. The hour of birth is at hand. The waters break and rend. There is blood. There are screams of pain. There is death and much anxiety in the air. Things look very bad for our mother and all of her children. The truth awaits just on the other side of the ever-dissolving veil where all the screaming and the mess is going on. The truth opens its arms wide to lovingly receive the newborn and to comfort it. Isn't it wonderful, the truth exclaims? I am your scout, and this is my report. Rest in peace, Michael Rupert, and my condolences to all the people who loved him. This is a tough battle in which we are engaged, one that can wear us down to our souls. So I encourage you to go outside and hug a tree or stay inside and hug someone you love. Be kind and gentle with yourself. And no matter how annoyed you get with others within our movement or how much you disagree with them, do not attack. We can all find ourselves in a fragile state. And when we're there, it does not take much to inflict real damage. So take care with yourself and with others as we fight for what we believe. And Michael, wherever you are, we can use all the help you're capable of sending our way. Safe journey. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, April 15, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, King 5 News in Seattle with their wonderful reporter Susanna Frame, Lisa Moulton Howell's Earth Files, New York Times, Fairwinds Energy Education, Asian Perspective, Japan Daily Press, Associated Press, CapeCodOnline.com, SafeEnergy.org, KQED, KCRW, Ideasphere on Public Radio Exchange, the IAEA, believe it or not, World Nuclear News, Bloomberg, Before It's News.com, RT.com, GG Press, Kyoto News, and the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. Please stop by, say hello, be our friend. Special thanks this week again to Sean Arclight and Christine Dillon Strickland for their ongoing help in posting nuclear hot seat each week during our web meltdown. Edward Phillip, who stepped forward to provide a temporary hosting page for each week's episode. Richard Villasana, the Mexico guru, who continues to put his tech whizzes to work on getting this website problem straightened out. Thanks to you all. I deeply appreciate it. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV. We're now on three times a week, including a flashback random replay on Tuesdays. Our archive right now is available on iTunes. We will be back on NuclearHotSeat.com slash blog, only not quite yet. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications, all rights reserved but fair use allowed. You have permission to reuse as long as you are a not-for-profit entity and that you give us proper attribution, meaning website and my name.